As I said a moment ago, some pastors or preachers have claimed that these verses from John 14 that I read to you, verses 7 through 11, are part of one of the most difficult passages in the Gospel of John. And as I prepared this message this week, I found myself wishing that, well, maybe I should have taken some more Sundays off and uh, why didn't I take two or three Sundays or maybe even more because this is such a difficult passage of Scripture. And now I think you see why pastors uh, impose upon themselves, at least many of them do, the discipline of preaching through various books of the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, making their way through that. Because the truth of the matter is, if we didn't do that, the, the, the discipline, if we didn't discipline ourselves that way, there are some passages that we would never touch. We would never read them. We would never preach through them. We would never have anything to say about them. This is one of those passages, most probably. But back when I announced many, many, many months and months and months ago that I was going to preach through the Gospel of John, I was not thinking of John 14 in this case, and I wasn't thinking of these verses from John 14 in this passage of the New Testament. But let me start with a word from the Old Testament, and I will give you the gist or the point of this exchange between the Lord Jesus and Philip, his disciple. There's a conversation here, and you see Philip's name mentioned there in verse 8. He and Jesus have this conversation about knowing God and seeing God. And then after I give you the gist of it, the second part of the message is, I want to give you some practical ideas or lessons from this. That's the easy part. The hard part's getting the gist of this. So let's Let's jump in here on the gist or the point of this exchange between Jesus and Philip. This is the hard part now. This is the difficult part. It's hard to understand exactly what's going on here. When I say hard, that's what I mean. The practical lessons that I want to offer to you today and draw out from this, I think, are are very plain to see, easy to see. But I don't know about you, but I have two problems with the Bible when it comes to the Word of God. And it goes like this. There are parts I don't understand. Are there parts of the Bible you don't understand? No, there's parts I don't. And that's hard for me. But here's the other part. The parts I do understand are hard for me. You know what I mean? They're hard for me. So I want to talk to you, first of all, about the part I don't understand when it comes to John 14 here, that I don't understand this very well. And then I want to talk to you about the things that I do understand pretty well. And I think you understand them pretty well, too, but you need to be reminded, like I do, from time to time about this. When a preacher says he's going to give you the gist of a passage or a section of Scripture or something, that really means that's just kind of cover, that's kind of camouflage from saying, I really don't understand it very well at all, so I'm just going to take a stab at this and see how it goes. So as I said, I want to start in the Old Testament with this. Do you remember way back there in the days of Moses in the the books, opening books of of the Old Testament, he's leading the children of Israel out of Egypt And do you remember that in those times when they're leaving, in the process of leaving the country of Egypt, and they go into the land of Canaan, God had blessed them with a visible symbol of His presence. You all remember that part of the Bible? Remember that? Where God's leading them out, and day by day, He gives them a visible symbol of His presence. Remember that? You remember the pillar of cloud by day. Every day there was a pillar of cloud, and they would follow that as long as it kept moving. When it stopped, they would stop. And at night, that would turn into a pillar of fire. And it was watching over them, or leading them, sometimes even at night. Now, that sounds like a strange place to begin a sermon on John 14, doesn't it? But but just stay tuned, stay with me now. When the people of God were commanded by the Lord to build the tabernacle later on in the Old Testament, this is a big tent that had all these objects in it. And this was to be the center of their worship. The Bible says that when the tabernacle was finished, God filled that tabernacle with His presence in a powerful way, like a cloud that filled the whole place. This is what was going on in the tabernacle. That pillar of cloud that hovered over them by day and that pillar of fire that led them by night were symbols of God's presence. And that cloud in the tabernacle was a symbol of God's presence, God dwelling among His people See the same thing with the tabernacle. And later on when they build the temple, you see the same thing. God's presence comes down in such a way that it fills the place. It fills it so much they have to get out of there. Now the temple was a permanent place, not a tabernacle that would move from place to place. Solomon leads the people of Israel to build the temple. When the temple is built, same cloud of the presence of God comes down into the temple, fills the place. Now just put all that on the shelf for just a moment and we'll come back to that here in a little bit. Now we fast forward to John 14, and here we are in the presence of Jesus. 
and 11 of his disciples. I say 11 because you know what's going on here in John 14. Judas has already left to go out and do his terrible deed of betraying Jesus. He's out there planning and plotting this horrible errand of betraying Jesus and leading his enemies to Jesus. So he's not with them here in John 14. And Jesus has just astounded the 11 who are left here. He shocked them and astonished them. He has stunned them because he has told them that he's going to be leaving them. So he says, I'm about to go away. And they don't know what to do here. Go with me to chapter 13 of John's gospel. These last few verses, we see this. Go down to verse 36 of John 13. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? There it is. Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward, he says. You can't follow me now, but you will afterward. Jesus is speaking there to Simon Peter in the hearing of the rest of the disciples, the eleven, and he says those words, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. Jesus was going away from them, and they would not be permitted to follow him for the time being. Now, they would eventually, but not at the moment. So to relieve or ease some of the sorrow and the pain and the anguish of all this that these disciples felt over the announcement, Jesus tells them in the opening verses of chapter 14 about a place. And he calls it the Father's house down there in verse 2. He says in John chapter 14 verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. The last time we were together, we were talking about that. He's saying this to them to comfort them and help them through this hard time. He calls it the Father's house there in verse 2, this place. He says it's a place of many mansions, many dwelling places. He's going away to prepare this for them. He says, he says he's going to come back. Verse three says that if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. So he's telling them this to help them deal with the fact they're about to no longer see him physically in his presence. He says, I'll come back. I'll take you there. These words must have seemed so sad to them. They may have caused this sorrow even maybe to temporarily back up a little bit or lift a little bit. But they caused great confusion and bewilderment as well. And that came in in the place of their sorrow because the words of Jesus didn't even faintly resemble what they thought, what they had in their minds when it came to their ideas of their Messiah and what their Messiah should do. This was so different from what they thought. They were bewildered. They were confused. All this sounds nice, Jesus, the Father's house, many mansions, you're coming back, but this is nothing like our dream of our Messiah. This is what we were thinking you'd be like. Their idea of the Messiah was that He would come in, He would take over, and that meant that Jesus, the Messiah, was going to throw those Romans out, kick them out of their country, because at this time they're under the Roman bondage of the Roman government. So the disciples are expecting a Messiah with a military and a political nature. They were expecting one to come in there and flex his muscles and kick those devils out and give us our country back. That's what they thought the Messiah would do. And not only that, but they were expecting him to take the nation of Israel from its lowly status and put her in the place of supreme position over all the other nations of the world. But here Jesus, the man that they knew in their hearts was the Messiah, they knew this. He's talking about going away. He says, I'm going to be leaving you. I'm going to be preparing a mansion for you. I'm going to be coming back again and taking you back there to that place that I'm preparing for you. And they're saying to themselves, they're scratching their heads and saying, what happened to our dream that the Messiah is going to come back and take Israel to this place of number one priority, supremacy, and position? And then Jesus says these words to them down in verse 7. If you had known me, really known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on you know him and have seen him. There it is. You've known him and seen him. Now those last few words of verse 7, and have seen him, gave the disciples just a glimmer of hope for just a moment. See God? What do you mean see God? Philip is speaking for the uh, other disciples. He seizes that little glimmer of hope there in verse 8 about seeing God. 
And immediately his mind goes back to the scriptures I told you about a moment ago, where a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, a visible sign of God's presence, his mind goes back to that, signs of the presence of God. I told you that cloud filled the temple when they built it. That was a sign of the presence of God. But I think when Philip heard these words here from Jesus about seeing God, he said, well, now Jesus is finally talking our language. He's he's finally saying stuff that we understand. We're going to have something like what happened back there in the Old Testament. This is going to be great. We're going to see God. This is going to be great. God's going to come down on the nation of Israel, and He's going to make Himself known to all the world that we are His people. So what I'm suggesting to you this morning in these words that Jesus spoke to Philip, that they are going to see God. That Philip and the disciples concluded that their dream about a national Messiah to restore Israel to the position of the top nation in the world, the number one country in the world, was not completely lost. It's still on the table. Somehow Jesus will pull this off. Somehow he'll get this together and it'll happen. This was because they thought when they heard him say to see God, They thought they would see God in the sense that the Old Testament people had seen God, a visible sign or symbol. And that vision of God would show that Israel had been restored back to its rightful position as the supreme country over all others. Now, I think that's what Philip had in mind. And the Lord Jesus says to Philip there, Philip, you don't realize it, but the truth of the matter is you have seen in me something far greater, far more glorious than those Old Testament saints saw in the pillar of the cloud and the pillar of the fire. You have seen in me, Philip, something far more glorious than you realize. That pillar of cloud, after all, was just a sign or a token of God's presence, but Jesus Christ is God himself in human flesh. Do you all see that? This is God in flesh talking to Philip. You want to see God? Look at Jesus. That's God. That's God. So Jesus says here to Philip, Philip, don't you understand yet that when you've seen me, you have really seen God the Father? He says it there. You've seen him. You've known him when you've seen me, looked at me, known me. But what did Jesus mean there in verse 7 when he said, you're going to see God? What's he talking about there in verse 7? I suggested to you that Philip took this to mean that the nation of Israel was going to be restored back to the place of number one position over all the other countries in the world and that God is going to come in a form like he did in the Old Testament and he's going to put his stamp of approval on his Messiah and the work of his Messiah. I think that's what he had in mind whenever Jesus said, you're going to see God. But what did Jesus really mean by that? Jesus was simply saying here in John 14, folks, that they were about to enter into a stage where they had never been before. They were going to see things they've never seen before. They were to enter into this stage in which their small, narrow-minded little views of God's nature and God's work was going to be radically changed. It's about to be exploded and expanded. The view of the Messiah that they had, how did God fit into that scheme of things anyway? In that scheme of things, God is just the God of Israel alone, just the nation of Israel. Folks, aren't you glad He's more than just the God of Israel? Well, that was pretty tepid. We'll try that again. You're glad He's more than just the God of Israel, aren't you? I'm very glad about that. He was, And He was more than just a God who was primarily concerned about the earthly nation of Israel and the earthly kingdom of Israel and a temporary nation called Israel. Jesus says, now you're going to see God in an altogether new way. In a new way. Your little narrow view of God is about to be changed, Philip, he's telling him here. And through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, and through His resurrection from the dead, and through His ascension, His rising back up to be at the right hand of the Father in heaven, these men had their little narrow view of God completely exploded and expanded. And they came to recognize, as you see later on in the gospel, in the New Testament, the fullness of this on the day of Pentecost, that God is not just the God of one nation. He's not just one nation's God. That He was the God of the Gentiles as well as the Jews. He wasn't just concerned about an earthly kingdom called Israel down here on earth. He was concerned about the eternal kingdom up there in heaven, much bigger than just some kingdom down here. 
So while their whole view of God was about to be changed here, that's what he's saying there in verse 7. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. That's what's wrapped up in that. They were about to see God in an altogether new light. Now that's the gist of this exchange between Jesus and Philip. Philip was expecting one thing, and Jesus was talking about something very different, very different. Philip was expecting a Messiah from that, from that phrase to see God to mean, well, our dream is going to finally come true. It's going to be fulfilled. The Messiah is going to bring in this earthly kingdom and God is going to show His approval of that earthly kingdom by coming down upon it in a cloud or a fire or some way like He did in the Old Testament. That's what's about to happen. And Jesus says, no, Philip, no. That's not what's... You're, you're not getting it. You're not understanding. You're going to see God but not in the way that you think you're going to see Him. In fact, Philip, you've already seen God. You've seen God in me, Jesus. You've already seen Him. I've come to do the work of eternal salvation, and you're going to see more and understand more of what the purpose of God is all about, not just some earthly kingdom. You're going to understand more of the nature of God than you've ever understood before. Well, you can take that home with you today and wrestle with that in your own thoughts and, and meditations and see what you can do with this passage of Scripture. I said that's the difficult part of the message. That's it. But now in the time I've got left here, I want to give you some, the undifficult part, if you will, the easy part, and I want to give you some lessons that we get from this. Here's the first one. What I want to do is to show you the lessons we have from this exchange between Jesus and Philip and showing you these lessons that I'm about to mention to you. I want you to, to tell you that I don't think Philip had in mind the things that I'm talking about. I don't think these things crossed his mind. I think Philip was operating on a very different level than, than I'm operating on. Now, Philip's words unwittingly, unknowingly, give us some great truths here. We'll see that in just a minute. You've seen this before where, where somebody unwittingly or unintentionally speaks a great truth or gives a great insight into the truth. you remember this? Go back with me in John's Gospel to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, we saw this some weeks ago, where Caiaphas says something unwittingly. He's the high priest that year in John 11. He's so frustrated by what Jesus is doing, he's scared to death that the whole country is going to follow Jesus and be captivated by Jesus and carried away by Jesus. And he speaks out of a political concern here in John 11. And yet John tells us that in speaking that way, Caiaphas really told the truth. He really preached the gospel. Look at John 11, verse 50. Nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. He didn't know it, folks, but he's preaching the gospel there by saying one man's going to die for our sins. He doesn't know it, but he says it that Jesus came to die so that all of us don't have to die. He says that. That is die in the eternal sense of the word. Well, I've got several of these lessons. I want to give you the first one here. I want to suggest to you from what we see here in John 14 that every Christian, every believer, every true born-again Christian should have an earnest and serious desire to know God better. We're talking about knowing God here this morning. Every Christian should have a desire to know God better. Philip says here in verse 8, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Show us the Father. This was a desire to go beyond where he was. You and I, who know the Lord, ought to have a desire to go beyond where we are, where we have been, and where we are. Now, if you will read the history of the church and the biographies of the great men and women of the Christian faith, the great men and women of God in the history of the church, you will find that the greatest saints of God have always had this ongoing mark, this ongoing sign or this characteristic. They have always had a passionate longing to know God better. Do you? Do you want to know God better today? I think of Moses back there in Exodus who said back there in Exodus 33, show me your glory. Show me your glory. And you know the story. God shows him the back parts of himself because Moses couldn't take the full representation. That ought to be a heart cry that you and I are familiar with. Our hearts ought to cry out to God to this. God, show us your glory. We should have that same passionate longing. Show me your glory, God. Folks, don't you want to see that here in this church? It's okay if you get a little louder on that one. You want to see the glory of God here, don't you? Boy, I do. 
Don't you just find yourself longing to know God better, to understand Him better? Paul says the same thing in Philippians. If you'll turn there with me, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, he says it. Philippians 3.10, that I may know Him, know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul says, I know Him, but I want to know Him more. I want to know Him better. I want to know Him better. So while I'm suggesting to you this morning that Philip was an entire, on an entirely different level here. His request of show us the Father there in verse 8 ought to strike a warm response in our hearts as Christians, as sons and daughters of God. It ought to be your cry. It ought to be my cry, child of God. Show us your glory. Show us the Father, for we would want to know more about God. That ought to be what's on our hearts and minds. God, show us more of yourself so that we would know more about you. Oh, my friends, there are many, many reasons today why we should desire to know God better. Why should we? Well, there's many reasons. First of all, we should want to know God better just simply because of who God is. Have you thought about that lately? That ought to make us want to know Him better. Have you stopped and thought about who God is lately? He's the creator of life, the preserver of life. If you'll turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6, listen to what Paul tells the young pastor, 1 Timothy 6, verse 16. He's not only the creator of life, the preserver of life. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 16, he says this about God, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. This is the God with whom we're dealing. The God who's unapproachable in His light. This is the kind of being God is. God is sovereign. God is holy. God is majestic. Folks, God is bigger and better than anything else down here. Would you agree with that? He's bigger and better. He simply speaks a word, and it's so. Can you do that? I can't. I can't even get my son to do what I want sometimes. You know what I'm saying? I can't. God is blazing in His holiness and His glory. Don't you long to know something about this God, to know Him better? Doesn't this pique your interest a little bit to hear about this great being called God? Now, I'm amazed today at how much people have such great interest in movie stars and musicians and athletes. It's amazing to me how athletes are suddenly the political experts. Have you noticed that? They know everything. And I guess all this woke stuff and cancel culture stuff, it seems to be a little bit less interest people have in them and than there used to be, and that doesn't upset me at all because I, I really don't turn to a movie star to tell me what the future holds, do you? I really don't. Some would say this is poetic justice, by the way. But isn't it amazing, this world where we have so much fascination, even with presidents and politicians and their hairdos and how they look and what they wear and what they do, how, what they watch on TV, what they eat, and all of that stuff. We're fascinated with this stuff. But folks, I'm telling you this morning, there is a real being, God, who is far greater than our ability to understand. He is better than any president or politician or movie star or musician or athlete. He is better and greater than all of them put together, is He not? He's better than all of them. And you and I should have a desire to know Him better just because of who He is. We should also have an interest in knowing God better because, folks, He's had an interest in us. He has shown an interest in us. Isn't it amazing that this same God that I've described here is so majestic, so powerful, so sovereign, so wise, so loving, so great, should show an interest in little old us. Someone shows an interest in us, and we appreciate that. And we want to show an interest in them. You understand what I'm talking about. Someone's done that for you. You want to show it back to them. We want to respond in kind, we say. We ought to desire to know God better because He's shown an interest in us. Here's another reason why we ought to know God better, or want to know God better. We ought to desire to know God better because we're going to meet Him someday. Have you thought about that today? Someday we're going to meet Him face to face. 
People seem to run out there and get the latest issue of some magazine that talks about some Hollywood celebrity and that, they're ne- that they've never met in their life and in all likelihood they're never going to meet. There was a guy on a TV show years ago who said back in 1988 that the oceans of the world only had 10 years left to live. And folks, uh, we're still going long after that. I think his name is Ted Danson, and somehow Ted Danson knows the oceans. No, Ted doesn't. I wish he knew the one who knew who made the oceans. He would be better off knowing him. But folks, we're going to meet God someday. We may never meet these celebrities, and that's okay, but we're going to meet God someday. You ought to have a desire to know God better because you're going to meet Him face to face someday. The Bible makes that clear time after time after time and place after place after place. So that's one lesson from this. Here's a second one. If we would know more about God, we must learn Jesus Christ. If we would know more about God, we must learn Jesus Christ. Because the Lord Jesus made it perfectly clear here in these verses. He says in the first part of verse 7, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also, he says. Verse 9, he says about halfway down there, verse 9, He who has seen me has seen the Father. And then in verses 10 and 11, he says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. He says, look, I am in him, he's in me. You see me, you see him. If you want to learn Christ, you must study his words and you must study his works. I'm telling you, if you want to know God better, study Jesus Christ. People say, well, I don't need so much to believe in Jesus. I just believe in God. Folks, you can't do one without the other. Amen? They go together. Why? Because they are the same one, the same person, same God. If you want to study Jesus Christ, you must study His words and His works. Now, where do you find the words of the works of Jesus? Oh, that's right. You find them here in Holy Scripture. That's where they are. That's why we have Sunday school. That's why we preach. That's why we have Bible school. That's why we do Bible studies, to get the Word of God into people's lives. So if you would know God better, study Jesus. If you would study Jesus, study Scripture. That's how it goes. That's where it comes from. Now, this disappoints some people, I know, because they think in order to study God, you just go out somewhere in nature, you get all by yourself, you sit out there somewhere, and you sit there and you chant, and you let your mind roam, and you sit there and om oh, and all that kind of stuff. Folks, can we just say a word about that? That's goofy. Can we just say it? That's just plain goofy. If you want to study God, get your nose in this book. That's where He is. He's in this book. And learn the words and the works of Jesus. And through Jesus, you'll get to know God better. Quickly, here's another lesson we get from John 14 here. A third practical lesson from this exchange Philip has with Jesus goes like this. The longer we walk with Christ, the more we ought to know about Him. The more we ought to know about Him. Did you hear that word of rebuke there in verse 9? Jesus gives a word of rebuke or disapproval to Philip. He says there in verse 9, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? I've been with you so long. Now, you know how this timeline went. Jesus walked with these men, including Philip, for at least three and a half years, at least. And the Lord Jesus says, Have I walked with you so long, Philip, and you still don't know me? It's sad when I hear couples say that to each other. I don't know you anymore. Because, folks, when people are married, that's the goal is to know, to get to know each other. And when Philip hears this from Jesus, have I been with you so long and yet you've not known me? I don't know about you, this hits me like a ton of bricks. I don't know about you, but it does me. Because folks, I've walked with Jesus a lot longer than Philip did. A lot longer than three and a half years. How long have you walked with him? Have you thought about that today? The longer you walk with Christ, the more you ought to know about him. The more you ought to be like him. And the more you know about Christ, the more you will know about God. That's how it all goes together. Do you realize that Christ has appointed certain means or ways by which we get to know Him? The old theologians used to call these the means of grace or the means of growth in grace. They are means of growth in terms of knowledge of what we know. God has appointed certain means. He says, if you really want to grow in your knowledge of me, you must use these means, these ways. And if you diligently use these means, you'll grow in your knowledge of God. He's very clear about that. Well, what are the means that God has appointed? Well, here are just some of them. Bible study. And I don't just mean time in Sunday school. I mean time alone with you and God looking at His Word. 
That's one of the means of the growth of grace. Prayer is another means of the growth of grace. Where you talk to God, God talks to you when you read His Word, you talk to Him when you pray to Him. Now, I'm just asking you, are, are you using these means today? Here's another one, what you're doing right now. Public worship is one of those ways that God has appointed that we can grow in our knowledge of Him. Are you using the means? You know what we're going through. People are still scared, afraid to come. They're saying, that they're, I'm going to get sick and die if I go to church. Meanwhile, they go to the grocery store, gas station, drugstore, and they think nothing about the risk factor there, but somehow here, it's too risky. God has appointed this. God says, do this. doesn't say, think about it. He says, do this. You may be sitting here today asking yourself, or saying to yourself, rather, I made my profession way uh, faith way back years and years ago. I was 10 or 12 or 15 or wherever it was, and I've walked with the Lord these 20, 30, 40 years, whatever it is. But let me ask you, do you know God better today than you did when you started walking with Him? You should. The longer you walk with Him, the better you should know Him. It's just another way of asking. Have you been using these means that I mentioned to you? Well, one last lesson, then we'll pray. I would draw from this exchange between Jesus and Philip one last lesson. It goes like this. The more we know about God, the more peace and satisfaction we will find. I think when Philip said, show us the Father and it's sufficient for us there in verse 8, or that's, that will satisfy us is what sufficient means. He was saying, if we could just see God coming down from heaven upon Israel like He did in the Old Testament, if we could see that today, Jesus, that's really all we want. Lord, we don't, we don't, we don't know anything about this going away in mansions in the Father's house and coming back and all that. We don't know about that. All we're really interested in is seeing God come down on Israel today the way He did back then. If we could just see that, we'd be satisfied. Just show us that, Jesus, and we'll be satisfied. But of course, Jesus was talking about something very different than what Philip was. Philip was just saying that, 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 that he, by saying that he gives us a simple truth here, he says, if we would just know God, if, if, if it would satisfy us. If we would just know Him, it would satisfy us. The more we know about God, the more satisfied we're going to be, and the more peace we're going to have, the more we know Him. I dare you this afternoon to even start, to go to our church library and read some of these great histories of the church about the great men and women of God. And get their testimony, and you'll find it to be true. The more a person knows about God, the more peace and the more satisfaction they have. Not the less, but the more. That is the consistent testimony of the history of the church. People are trying all kinds of things today to find satisfaction. You know that. But are they really satisfied today? They're running after money. They think money will satisfy them. It doesn't. They run after booze. Does that satisfy them? No, it doesn't. Some people are running after this and that. With all this running, you look out at America today, people are chasing all these different things, and you'll find that with all of our running, there are very few people who are satisfied. Very, very few. Thank God there are some of us who have found in God perfect peace and satisfaction. And you can find it there today too. You can find it. Philip unwittingly, unknowingly announced a great truth here in John 14. Show us the Father and it will satisfy us, he says it there in verse 8. The more you get to know God, the more peace, the more happiness, and the more satisfaction you're going to find. Because folks, He is the ultimate source of peace and satisfaction, is He not? You can say amen to that, that's okay, because that's who He is. You can do that. May God help us to take home to our hearts these truths today, that knowing God better, seeing God, brings great joy, great hope, great help, great peace, great satisfaction. Would you bow with me and pray with me? Father, we thank you today for the privilege to be back with our family here at St. Clair Southern Baptist Church. And we thank you for this strong word from you about knowing you and seeing you. And that's only possible as we look at your son, Jesus. For you are the perfect picture of God, Jesus, for you are God. Yes, you came from God. Yes, you're part of the Trinity. Yes, all of that's true. But the Bible is very clear. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And that's you. And that's why it matters so much that we know you, see you, follow you, and obey you. And so, Lord, we have this moment now where we're going to sing to you just a second. 
where we're asking people who don't know you, if they're here today and they don't know you, they, they haven't seen you, they don't have this peace, they don't have this satisfaction, they know something inside is not right, something inside is wrong, something inside is missing because they don't know you. We would ask, God, that you would speak to their hearts, draw them to yourself, even now, as we give this invitation for them to come to Christ, that they would come to you, Jesus, and give themselves to you. And for those of us that have, who have known you, seen you and your Son, who've been blessed and saved by your grace and your mercy and your kindness and your love, may we rejoice in this, God, that we have had the privilege to know the Almighty God and to see Him through His Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray these things. Amen.